So we're talking about transformation, about what it means to be transformed as a steward that therefore God can use me to be a steward leader. And I believe that this has these three movements. The first one is internal. This personal transformation we talked about on all four levels. The second one then is communal, leading your people for the transformation of your community. So as pastors, as leaders, as business people, whatever your role might be, um, our job now is to take what God is doing in us and be able to begin to lead our people toward that same kind of freedom, that same kind of transformation that we're seeing affected in us. And as we do, it will impact our community. And beyond our community, it will change the overall organization, leading your ministry for organizational transformation. Um, it starts with us, then it goes to the people around us, and finally it will get out to the organization. So if you're a pastor, it starts with you, then it goes to your leadership team and elders, those people around you, and as they catch this vision and become set free day by day, then it will go right out into the congregation. If you're a business person, it's the same thing. If you work in a nonprofit organization, it's you and then it's your leadership team and your board. And as they catch that vision and see that transformation happens, it'll go out to your people, it'll go out to your programs, it'll go out to your financial supporters, and it just expands into the kingdom. But it all begins right with us. And then it moves. And then there's this idea of trajectories. And I won't go into too much into detail in this because those of you that are in the class are going to hear lots more about this. But um, I, had to, I had to have an ac accountability when I wrote this book because I didn't want to get all, all the way to this point and then all of a sudden come up with the five, thing, the five things you need to do to be a steward leader. I mean, that kind of undermine everything, wouldn't it? You gotta look at this and go, wait a minute, you just got done talking about the fact that this isn't about traits. So it is important what we do as a leader. It is important that we do the right things after God has changed us inside. So how do we talk about that, that we don't have a, a list of 12 or 10 or whatever? So what I propose is this idea of a, of a trajectory, which is just, it's like shooting an arrow, isn't it? If you, if you know the wind and you know the speed of your arrow and you know all that, you can shoot it in the air and have a pretty good idea of where it's going to go. It's not prescriptive, but you can, you can see the trajectory. So what I wanted to propose is that if we live as steward leaders, there are things we can probably assume are going to happen in the organizations that we lead. And so I wanted to, I wanted to um, posit it in that way rather than just a list of things that we're supposed to do. So the first one is um, there's a, about our transformation, the transformation of the people we lead, and the transformation of the organizations we serve. And I'll say a lot more about that here in a minute. So this is this idea of a definition of a steward leader is simply a holistic faithful steward who is called to lead. Um, and then there are these four areas that we talked about before. As we look at what it means that the steward leader is in God's presence, which is our first relationship, in the mirror, our relationship with ourself, in relationship to one another, and in relationship to God's creation. And the implications for this transformation are three things. One, is that it's holistic. When we talk about the, the transformation that God has in us, He doesn't just transform a part of us, does He? It's not just about one level. It's not just about one part of my life. Transformation is holistic. It's, it's about everything we have and everything we are. It's distributive, which means it doesn't stop with us. If it's true transformation, it's going to impact everybody around us. And it's ongoing. None of us arrive. I don't think. Has anybody arrived? Are you there yet? Fully transformed? Holy? You know, Jesus said, God, Jesus said we're supposed to be holy. Anybody there yet? 100%? Uh, it's a journey. But we're moving. It's ongoing. It's this constant work of transformation. The only time we get into trouble as leaders is when we sit on the bench at the side of the road. Okay? We weren't, we weren't meant to be bench sitters. We're on the journey, and the journey continues. The journey continues. All right, so I'm going to end my time with you today with just walking through then the seven marks of a steward leader. And these are going to be pretty straightforward based on all that we've said, but I want to try to use this as a, an overview of the whole course and just to kind of sum some things up here together. So, if, if our definition is a, a steward leader is a faithful steward called to lead. And we're called to be um, faithful stewards in all four of these, these relationships. We talked about the two kingdom challenge. I've already, we've already done all this, so we don't have to do this again. You saw this before. Okay. And that was our prayer. So, seven marks. Here's the first one. 
The first mark of a steward leader is that steward leaders understand that their lives are not their own. They are stewards of every area of life and resist the temptation to play the role of master. They daily take a posture of listening to God's leading and responding with joyful obedience. So that was, that's why we set the stage this morning. Because this is really one of the first two things that undergird what we are. Steward leaders start from that perspective that this is not, my life is not my own. My business is not my own. My church is not my own. My marriage is not my own. My kids are not my own. I tell you, that was a hard one for me. Um, one day I was struggling with, um, you know, something about something happened with one, I don't remember what it was, with one of our kids. And I, I was talking to a friend and mentor of mine, and he said something to me that just shook me to the core. He said, Scott, you realize that God loves your children more than you do. Whew. Did you hear that? Do you believe that? That God loves your children more than you do? That was, that was one of the most comforting but convicting things that I had ever heard. I'll tell you another real wonderful little story. I just heard this about a month ago from a guy in my church. And he said, um, he tried to teach his kids about being faithful stewards. And so every week they got, I think, like a $5 allowance. And he gave it to them on Sunday. And they could do what they wanted to. But he asked them if they would consider giving 10% of it to church. And on Sunday, he would kind of watch and see what they did. And they would give their 50 cents to church and kind of learning about tithing. He said one, one Sunday, something happened. And they, they just didn't get around to giving him the money. And so the next week, they gave him $10 for the two weeks. Um, and they do it on Sunday morning before they go to church. And so the kids all got their $10. They went to church, and a missionary spoke about the work that was being done in, in their country. Um, and when they passed the plate, he watched his little daughter, and she took her $10 and put it in the offering. And he said, my first reaction was, I want her, I want to reward her. I want, her, I want to bless her life for this moment. I want, I want to take her home and hug her. And I want her to know how joyful I am as a father that she would do this. And I just, don't you just want to bless your kids when you see that? You want to do anything in the world for them? You just want to, you want to see them have more to give away and all the rest of that? And he said, and as I was thinking about how much I just would love to bless her for this act that she did, the scripture came to mind from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And if you, Father, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give good gifts as His children? Isn't that great? So when you and I are faithful stewards, think of what it does to the heart of God. He just rejoices. He gets so excited. He just wants to bless us because that's what He wants for His children. When He sees it in our lives, He has that same reaction toward us that that father had toward his child. I just, that really blessed me. I love that story. Isn't that a great story? Right? That, that's exactly how God reacts to us. He loves to see that happen in our lives. So our lives are not our own. We're only stewards. We get that great opportunity to step back and just see it in, from God's perspective. That is the basis and foundation for this idea of being a steward leader. Steward leaders seek intimacy with God as their highest calling. They prioritize activities that nurture this intimacy and reject the temptation to allow urgent matters to rob them of it. They follow God's leading wherever it may take them and the ministry. So, um, you heard Alan Barnhart talk a lot about knowing what the owner wanted to do. What does the owner want us to do? It only makes sense to be stewards if we're passionate about knowing what the owner wants us to do with his stuff, right? So I told the folks at Frontline the other, yesterday, and I believe this with my whole heart, the single greatest job of a pastor is to know the will of the owner. The single greatest role we have as leaders is to know the will of the owner. The single greatest thing we'll ever do in our lives as followers of Jesus is to know the will of the owner. And when we know it, we carry it out with joy and with freedom. So 
what are we cultivating, what are we doing and cultivating in our lives to make sure that we have got the kind of intimate relationship with the owner that we can truly hear and know and understand what the owner would have us do? To me, that's the greatest, the great leadership question. If I had one question to ask every leader, every Christian leader, that would be my one question. What are you doing to cultivate the kind of intimate relationship you need to make sure that you can hear and know the will of the owner? If we don't know that, then really nothing else matters. We are, as my professor said, thrown back on ourselves to go and figure it out. Well, that's not what God wants for us, is it? He doesn't want us to be thrown back on ourselves. So what does this mean to, to cultivate this intimacy? Um, I shared a little earlier today that um, this, this struggle I had between being and doing, and I really pray that you take that seriously as leaders. Um, I, one, of the, one of the great tools or, or weapons of the enemy, interestingly enough, is to get us so zealous for doing God's work that we end up doing it without him there's no room for him. We are so busy, as, we, as I said, doing work of the kingdom that we have no time to spend any time with the king. Um, and that is a real danger for us, especially as pastors, because of the, 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 the pressures put on you, the expectations put on you to perform, and all the rest of it are huge, aren't they? Could you not spend 60, 70 hours a week if you really wanted to try to meet everybody's needs and, and meet all the expectations of the people in your church? It, it's endless. So where do you say no? Where do you stop? Where do you carve out time? And most importantly, is your time with God your highest priority? Your highest priority. I had a story of a, um, I went to visit a pastor when I was, when I was president of the seminary. I went to visit one of our, one of our alumni. And um, I happened to be a small town in the middle of Pennsylvania. Um, nobody really had a chance to call on him because he was from kind of a small church. And I'll, I'll never forget this encounter. I, I met him at a restaurant, and when he walked in, he looked like somebody had taken a stick and just beat the daylights out of him. You know that? His expression, his look, he just kind of slunked into the, and sat down across from me, and we began talking. And of course, I asked him, I said, well, how you doing? And he told me the story of this little congregation that had just heaped on him huge expectations of things that he would do, places that he would be, you know, 15, or not 15, 10, 11, 12 hour a day, days, seven days a week to try to meet the needs of this very kind of critical little congregation. And then he told me the story. He said, Scott, I realized I was shriveling up spiritually. And so I put together a little proposal and it basically said, look, on Tuesdays, from 8 until 12, no, actually it was all day, wasn't it? Yeah, it was all day. He said, on Tuesdays, I want to have Tuesdays carved out for me to be able to read and pray, seek God's will, prepare my sermon, think about how I can be spiritually ready to be your pastor. Because I'm, I'm dying. So he put it together in a proposal, and he took it to the elders meeting. And they passed it out ahead of time, so everybody had a chance to read about it. Um, and when it came up to be discussed, the chairman of the board looked out at the elders and said, we will now consider the pastor's proposal for another day off. Did you hear that? That's all they could see. He just wants another day off. They had no sense of how critically important it was that their pastor took dedicated time to have intimacy with God. And it was, it was killing him. So what about your people? What about your pastor? Are you coming alongside your pastor and making sure that they are spending the time and dedicating what they need to have that intimacy with God? As you are a pastor, are you protecting that time and helping your parishioners understand how important it is that you have that. If you're a head of a nonprofit organization, are you doing the same thing? Do your people value the time that you're spending making sure that your relationship with God is such that you can hear Him clearly and walk according to His will and purpose? As I said earlier, this, this is where the enemy is killing leaders, just killing leaders. And we sometimes put that 
on ourselves. Enough said there. Can you pray about that? Think about that? Please hear this admonition. Don't get stuck in this. Who you are becoming is more important than what you do. Who you are becoming in Christ is more important to the kingdom of God than what you do. We have to shift those priorities. Steward leaders seek intimacy with God as their highest calling. Number three, steward leaders are secure in their identities in Christ, Jesus Christ. They stand firm on that certainty and reject the temptation to desire affirmation or applause from any other source. This positions them to absorb criticism and deflect praise. Wow, um, this is like four hour teaching we're gonna do tomorrow afternoon for those of you who are in the course and all. So I'm not gonna put all that into it. There's so much here we could say. So let me see if I can get it down to something. For those of you who are just with us today, I really wanna, I wanna share this with you so you can understand what we're trying to, we're trying to get at here. <clears throat> all of us ground our identity in something, our self image comes from some source, right? And as children of God, our one sole source for our self-understanding, for our self-worth, should be the fact that we're a child of God. We're a redeemed child of the living God. Amen? And nothing should be able to dissuade us from that. When we look in the mirror in the morning, we should be able to look in that mirror, and the first thing we see and say to ourselves is, child of God. Um, we may also look and say, needs a shave, but child of God. Right? It's put on a little weight, but child of God. And maybe even more importantly, really messed up yesterday, but child of God. Facing some unbelievably big obstacles today, but child of God. Was told yesterday that they were not worth much a child of God. Whatever is happening around us should never take our gaze away from the fact that we look at ourselves and say, child of the living God. We go to bed at night and we hear the applause of nail-scarred hands. That's really all that should matter, isn't it? To know that we can stand before the Lord and know that He just delights in us just delights in us not because we're perfect right we mess up we do all kinds of things but we're a child of God we're redeemed by the blood of Christ our God delights in us and that's the sole source of our identity if that is true my friends you have a huge opportunity to be a steward leader and not get tied to finding your identity in other ways so what other ways might there be well primary way most of us Oh, let me look back. Let me come at this a little different way. Um, this idea that we see ourselves as a child of God and that, that it will not dissuade us in any way, shape, or form, that idea is so powerful in the life of one of God's children that the enemy absolutely hates it. He just hates it. If you see yourself as a child of God, no matter what's happening around you, you've just stolen a huge weapon from the enemy. He can't do anything with that. What's he going to do? He can throw stuff at you, and you can hit it, and you go, yep, you're right, that's true, but you know what? Child of God. Child of God. Doesn't change a thing. God loves me, delights in me. Child of God. It just nullifies the enemy in such a powerful way. So what does he do to try to get us away from that idea? What does he do to try and rob us of the freedom and joy that comes from that understanding of who we are? Well, he helps us to substitute other things for child of God. So we look at ourselves in the mirror and now our identity maybe is two or three different ways. Senior pastor and child of God. Seminary president and child of God. Uh, you know, a graduate of ATS and child of God. And anytime we add more things to that major way in which we see ourselves, we give the enemy an opportunity. He says, oh, so now your identity is going to be tied also to what you do, to your role, to your title. Well, we can do all, we, I can mess with that all day. And the enemy can mess all kinds of things with that if that's the way we're going to see ourselves. And he begins to do so. 
So here's what happens. Let me just put this real simply. You know, we've talked about being an owner leader and a steward leader. If you're an owner leader and you begin to tie your identity to the job that you hold, let's just go down that path for a minute. So now who I am, child of God is okay, it's over here, but who I really am is I am pastor of this church. That is my identity. That is how I value myself. That's where I get my applause from, right? Because anytime we find ourselves valued. So I need applause in my role as pastor in order to have my identity propped up. I need to be successful in my role as pastor for my identity to be propped up. So what happens if I fail? If I do something as pastor that is wrong, I get called on it. Our church suffers, something happens. And I, and I fail, or I make a major mistake. Well, here's the problem. Failure in my role now becomes failure in my personhood. You see? I didn't just fail as pastor. I failed as a person because I've just melded those two together. The steward leader can look at stewarding the role of pastor. That for a season, God calls me into a role, and I'm going to minister to this, in this place. I'm going to do my very best, but it's a role that, that I play. It's, it, I'm going to take this on. It's not my full identity, but it is what I'm going to give my passion to. Well, if I mess up in that role, I have this freedom to be able to, to, to own, own my mistakes and, and make changes and admit my failures and all the rest of it because I'm stewarding a role, aren't I? But I'm still a child of God. And nothing changes that. Oh, it's a very different way to lead. A very different way to lead when you can find that, that place of freedom with regard to your identity. And I'll go one step further, and this will set up the next slide. It changes the way in which we manage and look at the people around us. Um, people, when you, when you work for an owner leader, when their entire personhood is tied up in their job or their title, then everything around them has to adapt to their agenda, right? It's got to be their agenda. And everybody becomes a means to making sure that they are successful because they have to be successful because if they fail, it's not just the job that fails, they fail as a human being. It's a big slippery slope that we go down. And I want you all to see that. And then one last thing. The primary reason that we slip from being child of God identity to being identified with our job, you know the one biggest reason that we do that? It's because we've lost intimacy with the owner. So there's the tie. It's like a set of dominoes. We lose intimacy with God, we begin to trust in ourselves. We begin to trust in ourselves, we shift our identity for who we are in Jesus Christ to the job that I have, and all of a sudden now I'm an owner leader, and I've got fear and anxiety, and I've got to make sure that everybody um, is successful to make me successful and we just go down this slippery slope. It all starts with intimacy with God. You see it? How that links together? And that takes me here to this next one then. Uh, steward leaders see those with whom they lead and serve as fellow pilgrims. They shun the temptation to use others to further their own agendas. Consequently, they encourage the personal and spiritual growth of those they lead and with whom they serve. So, this is, this is pretty clear. Um, Here's one way to think about it. I, I framed what, our, what we're going through as a journey. We're, we're going from being two kingdom people to one kingdom people, right? God's calling us on this journey. If you see yourself on that journey, then when you look out at the people that you work with, the people that are in your church, the people that are in your business, your colleagues, everybody around you, we begin to see them through the lenses of fellow travelers. You see, all I'm doing today in our whole time together is I'm just inviting you on the journey with me, right? And I'm on that journey. I'm trying to be more faithful every day, and I'm just lifting it up to you and say, come on, let's all go together, and, and helping people on their journey. It's a very different way to look at the people that, let's say, that work for you than an owner leader would look at them because an owner leader doesn't care about their journey. He only cares about his journey and his identity and his success. Or she's got to be able to make sure that everybody around her does well to make her look good. She needs applause from her people because that's where her identity is. 
And so your journey doesn't really matter, thank you very much, because my journey, my journey dominates everything else. Now think about this for a minute. When it comes to um, uh, uh, empowering and lifting up other leaders in your organization, I think one of the greatest uh, opportunities for pastors and leaders, right, is to find other, other young people and, and help them help raise them up, right? Wouldn't we like all of our people to be fully what God created them to be and help them on their journey? Well, what happens if I'm senior pastor and, what is your name? Yeah. Arman, is that good? So I'm senior pastor and I hire Arman to be my associate pastor. And I let him start preaching. And all of a sudden people are coming and going saying, oh, Arman, he's a lot better preacher than you. He is so good. You should preach less and let Armand preach more. <laughs> what do I do with that as a senior pastor? Well, if my identity is in my job, that's going to threaten me terribly, isn't it? Saul has killed his thousands, but David, his ten thousands, right? Yeah, he's my David. And what do I do? I respond as Saul does and throw spears at him when he's not looking? I can do that in, in other ways than physical, can't I? I can undermine him. I can push him down. I can take away opportunities. He threatens me because my source of affirmation and my identity is being shifted from me to him. I have no room. I have no space to lift him up and let him flourish. But, oh, my friends, if I'm a steward leader, I'm just rejoicing. I'm saying, Armand needs a, he needs a church, he needs a congregation, he needs more. He need, we need to just give him everything he needs because God has empowered him and, and I just get excited about him. I can let people around me flourish, be better than me. I surround myself with eagles, right? And I rejoice in their success because, hey, I'm a child of God. And that's all I need. That's all I need. See the difference? So it's all in how we see our people and lift up our people and encourage our people. When our identity gets taken out of the equation, Oh, we can help people become everything that God created them to be. And I think that's our call as steward leaders. Number five, steward leaders regard all resources as gifts from God. They resist the temptation to hoard or waste them. Instead, they put them to work consistent with constructions in God's word and the leading of the Holy Spirit, and they do this for God's glory. So this now has to do with the created world around us. How do we as leaders see, view the resources that God has given us? And I'll just say a few, a few little words here. Um, it's easy for us to get to this point and say, oh, well, we do that pretty well. You know, we, we have a good budget at the church or, or our ministry does a good job of watching over their finances and, and really we're probably pretty good in, in this area. But this is where the enemy can deceive us, I'm afraid, again. My, 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 my question or my encouragement to you would be, say, what would it look like if you sat down with your leadership and you looked at all of the assets that God has given you? Now, that includes facilities, land, finances, people, time, opportunities, all the things that God has entrusted to you, and to say to him, what would you have us do with all that you have given us? How do we best steward all that you've laid in front of us? That seems pretty simple, but it's, it's amazing how few of us in our organizations actually go through that exercise. And look at everything that God has given, saying, are we being the best stewards in it, w w with, with everything we have? Look at uh, your people. Are we being the very best stewards with the people that we have? Are we paying them well? Are we encouraging them? Are we training them well? Are we lifting them up? Do our human resource policies reflect the values of the kingdom of God? Are we making sure they take good vacations? Do we care about their marriages and their families? Are we stewarding the people that God has entrusted to us? Are we stewarding the physical resources that God gave to us? I told this story up at, so you can take a break if you want to, Mike, I'm gonna tell the same story. Um, he's gonna think I only have one story for everything. Um, but we were working with a, a, a large suburban church. And suburban churches in the United States sometimes pride themselves on the big lawns that they have. And this church had a lot of land and had these beautiful, beautiful um, 
yard, you know, lawn, all the way around the church. And of course that meant that every year they had to fertilize it, they had to irrigate it, they had to put weed killer down on it, they had to mow it, and they had to edge it, and it was, you know, a lot of money and time into just keeping this beautiful lawn out there. Well, they finally, the leadership finally got to the point where they decided that they would ask this question of God. How would you have us steward this resource of land that you've given us? And they were convicted. And so, after a lot of prayer and conversation with the neighborhood, this church tore up most of its grass and it put in a community garden. It went into the low, low middle income parts of their surrounding neighborhood and it invited people to come and get a little tract, like a raised bed, you know, raised bed gardens. And they gave everybody, what is it, I think it was like an eight, six by eight or whatever. Um, and you could come in and it was your place for a garden because most of the people in the poorer part of town had no land, right? They were on these little postage stamp places where they lived or they were in an apartment or, or something like that. And suddenly all these people from the community were coming to the church and they were growing their own gardens and they were growing their own food and they were having community and fellowship and they got to know the people in the church and then the church kept a plot for themselves and they put in raised bed gardens and they raised all kinds of fruits and vegetables and they gave it to the local food bank which you know gives away food to the poor and so they were supplying food into the local food bank. Um, and then the young people got involved in it. They decided to start teaching the young people all about growing fruits and vegetables. And they learned a skill and they learned what was happening to the food bank. It just went on and on and on. And you know, several years later, um, they had this dynamic, vibrant, community-based ministry. Now, I'll tell you the truth. It didn't look very good. Have you ever seen a community garden? They're not necessarily the best looking things, are they? Some people let their garden grow and some of stuff up here and they got dead stuff and you got wheelbarrows and you got piles of, of compost and all the rest of it. So it wasn't a beautiful sight. But oh my goodness, the ministry that they did. They stewarded this bit of land that God had there. Just because they asked. And I think that's the point. Are we willing to ask God how he would have us steward everything that he has put into our care? And, and then, then we can be faithful stewards. And I'll just say a quick final word about the environment. Um, you know, I, I, am, you know, I do work with the uh, Evangelical Environmental Network. And we really care about God's command to us to care for creation. And so we need to look at the world around us and ask, how is my lifestyle and that of my organization contributing to caring for God's beautiful earth? And we all have lots of questions that we can ask, I think, along those lines. Bottom line is this. When people look at your organization, your church, your ministry, do they see great evidence that this is an organization that values what it means to be faithful stewards? As they walk around, as they talk to your people, as they listen to what's happening, as they read information from your organization, as they look at how you take care of your buildings, everything they see are you bearing witness to the world that we're stewards of what is God's? That's our opportunity as we minister where we are. Number six. Steward leaders recognize the spiritual battle they are in and they strive to lead as faithful stewards in a world of people playing the role of master. They speak the truth which sets people free from bondage so they may experience abundant life. And really, the big point here is that, um, as we've said all the way along, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. And this agenda, he hates it with a passion. This is the last thing in the world the enemy wants any of you doing when you leave here. He just wants us all to go back the way we've been living and forget all this even happened. Because um, this is transformational, not only for us, but for the world around us. And many of you are on this journey, many of you and many of the things I've talked about are already having victory in your life and all the rest of that, and he's just going to come against that. And that shouldn't scare us because we believe that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, right? That Jesus has overcome, that the victory has already been won. But we have to go into this lifestyle with the mindset of a warrior because we are going into a spiritual battle or we're in the middle of a spiritual battle for many of you, probably most of you. This is not easy stuff, is it? This is, a, this is hard for us internally. This is hard for us in community. This is hard sometimes for our church or our people we work with to understand. This is a spiritual battle. 
And I would just say from the very beginning, if you're ready to take this on, if you want to be steward leaders, then be ready for the battle. Put on the full armor of, of God. Um, avail yourself of all of the weapons that are available to us as children of God. Um, and realize that you're going to be the target. But you know what? As I said, the victory's already won. Um, and then finally, I have just a great little thing to land on here. Steward leaders have learned the victor learned that victory starts with surrender. They set aside the temptation of self-reliance and take on the mantle of a leader of no reputation. Only after surrendering can a steward leader is going to steward lead effectively. So I thought that was kind of an interesting little turn on a phrase. I don't know of any other battle on the face of the earth where victory starts with surrender. But that's the first thing we do. Isn't that weird? All right, troops, let's go into the battle. Let's surrender. And now we're ready. Isn't that true? Now we're ready. Because the battle belongs to the Lord. You know, it's not against flesh and blood. Um, so post that posture of surrender is really huge. And this last thing about being a leader of no reputation comes from an article I wrote. And actually, if you get the book, The Steward Leader, it's the first chapter um, about what it means that um, from Philippians chapter 2, the King James Version says, um, you know, it talks about Jesus who was uh, made, made uh, higher than the angels, became, uh, became flesh, emptied himself, took on the form of a servant. Uh, in the King James it says, um, uh, became, a, became a man of no reputation. Didn't mean he became a man of bad reputation. It's just that the idea of reputation no longer mattered to him. It wasn't about him. He emptied himself completely. He denied himself, right? That he could take up his cross, that we might take up ours. And that idea of being leaders where reputation doesn't matter. One of the most freeing things anyone told me that kind of started this whole thing is that, Scott, you are not the caretaker of your reputation. Think about this. Pastors, you are not the caretaker of your reputation. You are not called to build a great reputation. You're called to be obedient to the owner. And sometimes, sometimes, those two will be in conflict. Okay? So, what will you do? If you want to see examples of that, read through the Bible and see how many times God called leaders to do silly, preposterous, ridiculous things that made them look foolish. Blew their reputation, but they were faithful. I think when... Um, when Joshua told his troops that they were going to go around Jericho 13 times before anything was going to happen, he probably became a leader of no reputation. I think they thought he was insane. Um, but look what God did, because he was obedient. So what does it mean to you to set aside reputation, to set aside fame, to set aside applause, take on the mantle of the steward leader, uh, knowing that victory in your life begins with this act of absolute surrender. So those are the seven marks. Steward leader, leaders understand that their lives are not their own. They seek intimacy with God as their highest calling. They are secure in their identities in Jesus Christ. They see those with whom they lead and serve as fellow pilgrims. They regard all resources as gifts from God. They recognize the spiritual battle they are in, and they strive to lead as faithful stewards in a world of people playing the role of master, and steward leaders have learned that victory starts with surrender. So, for the remainder of this week, for those of you who are journeying on with us, we are going to look at, um, we've looked at number one and number two today, of the, the, those two uh, chains, the chain of ownership that falls off of us, the chain of two kingdom living, that falls off of us, that we might become one kingdom people and give up control and give it back to him. This week we're going to look at the, the other five chains, and you've just heard them up here. That intimacy, intimacy with God is our highest calling, understanding our, our identity is in Christ, seeing our people as fellow travelers, and understanding that all the resources we have are, are, are um, his for us to steward effectively. And then we'll culminate our time together with an understanding of the spiritual warfare, the battle that we are really in and how we can be equipped to be God's people, uh, to be stewards in a world of owners. Um, and that, that will wrap up our time together. Thank you so much for, for listening and being a part of the day. I appreciate that.